19 goals, all coming your way in the next hour. Yes, it's a big match cup tie special that turns out to be a special kind of nightmare for goalkeepers with all those goals. And six of the 19, remember, come from the magnificent Georgie Best. As Fleet Street, with depressing uniformity, I thought, pointed out to us this morning, Mr. Sub-Editors, no prizes here. So our games today then are Crystal Palace against Chelsea, Northampton against Manchester United, and Swindon against Scunthorpe. But now let's get straight on with the action and start back at Selhurst Park yesterday. Crystal Palace against Chelsea, and a day when Palace can put their relegation worries aside. Their spirit and their form has improved since they lost heavily to Chelsea over Christmas. But they're again forced to name a team that is without their brightest star, Steve Kemba. They stick with Roger Hind in a number nine shirt, but no doubt are looking to his fellow Scott, Jerry Queen, to repeat his winning performance over Spurs in the last round. Palace know it's going to be tough against a Chelsea side that is their best for years. Today they miss Charlie Cook injured and Tommy Baldwin is at number seven. But at number nine is the biggest threat to Crystal Palace, Peter Osgood. He's already scored five against them this season. A lot of rain in the morning, but the crowd is 48,000 strong. They paid record receipts of 22,000 pounds. Referee Ray Tinkler of Boston. So Chelsea get us away for this cup tie. The last time they were here, they won by five goals to one over Christmas. And that day, Peter Osgood scored four of them. But it's a very much different Crystal Palace side now. Since then, they've played six games and lost only one of them. Their spirit is coming back. And the men, of course, that uh, Sir Alf Ramsey is probably here to watch would be Osgood and Hollins, both very much in the reckoning, in the public's mind at any rate, as places for Mexico. And there's the first shot of Osgood. A very hasty clearance by Blythe, who will be watching Osgood. It goes to Baldwin. Straight to Hudson. Blythe again. Queen. And Hoy finding Lachlan. Peter Bonetti. Now it's Hausman. A lot of rain. The ground obviously going to cut up very much indeed. Rockland in in a very determined fashion. Baldwin to Hollins. And Payne cutting that one out. Finding Tony Taylor. Dempsey back, or Harris backing off him. Hind going in with a header. And Panetti really pushed to the limits to get that one away. A good header by Hind. No doubt Panetti found difficulty getting a foothold there in his goal area. But that really was a good header by Hine and good work by Taylor. Taylor with the corner. Queen going in and Bonetti making sure. Now Hausman. McCready. Finding Hutchinson. Baldwin asking for it on the far side. But McCormick was in quickly. Now it's Hollins. One aim towards Hutchinson. And now Baldwin. And now Osgood. And now Hausman. Still has 
one. Good play. Baldwin with a header. Heading off the line by Lachlan. Baldwin again. And it's Blythe getting it away, but it's Hudson now. And Blythe at last giving some respite for a much harassed Crystal Palace. Web number two well up. And McCormick there first. Hudson to gather it for Chelsea. Hollins. And Hudson playing it through again. Hollins continuing his run. Good play. Just as well for Palace that Jackson spotted it. Oh, and a good jump there by Taylor, setting Queen away. Taylor's got into the middle. This is aimed towards him, and Hudson, of all people, right back. Tremendous play by Hudson. Baldwin finding Hutchinson. And Payne giving away the free kick. Local boy David Payne, under 23 international. And John Hollins, who's looking hard to become an England World Cup player with the free kick for Chelsea. Hoy giving away a corner. Again, Webb on the edge of the penalty area. Not as far forward as he normally goes. Hausman with the corner. Hutchinson and booted off the line by Loughlin. That's twice Loughlin's cleared off the line. McCready to pump it back in again. Sewell away. Hudson back in. And Sewell away again. McCready, Hudson, Harris. Baldwin in very vigorously, Hudson taking it up for Chelsea, a good break by him. Oscar in the middle and Hutchinson too. John Lachlan, a Scott, who has twice saved Crystal Palace off the line. Hutchinson to try another long one. Watching closely. Another fair throw. And McCormick giving away a corner. It's again an example of how these long throws from Hutchinson put pressure on the defence. The record uh, receipts of £22,000. 48000 Hudson with the corner. Jackson fisting it off the head of Hutchinson. Now Hausman. Osgood. Dempsey up again. corner, Osgood up for it with his head, and he's there, Osgood! A goal that I think the Crystal Palace defence will kick themselves for not stopping, but it's Osgood's 21st goal of the season, and it's Chelsea's very important first in this cup tie here. Chelsea 
slowly but surely had begun to look the more accomplished side. So now we shall just see how deep this spirit at Crystal Palace is. And whether they have the skill to beat a very fine Chelsea side. Dempsey really head and shoulders above fine at that, that time. Now uh, David Webb. Baldwin. To Hudson. And that's Jackson's. I bring it away for Crystal Palace. Taylor who really hasn't stopped working in this first half. Boy with the throw, and a good break here by Sewell, losing his balance when at least he wanted to lose it, and Harris to come in quickly for Chelsea. Osgood. Oh, and a good ball to find Baldwin. Auckland to cut it out. Payne. beaten by Hudson and Hudson with really encouraging determination getting in there as the whistle goes for half time the goal that puts Chelsea ahead scored by Peter Osgood number nine still to come on the big match program highlights from two other cup games Northampton Manchester United and Scunthorpe against Swindon or rather Swindon against Scunthorpe but the half-time score here at Selhurst Park is Crystal Palace nil, Chelsea one. More soccer action for you in just a couple of minutes. So it's Crystal Palace then preparing to kick off for the second half. They hadn't conceded a goal in their three previous games, but they are this very important goal down now. And quite honestly, on the uh, first half showing, it must be a certain amount of doubt whether they have quite enough guile to get past this very fine Chelsea side. Certainly there's a good deal of spirit left in this uh, Crystal Palace team for all that. But it's Chelsea's throw. And it's John Hollins to take it. out Webb but Webb recovered quickly and it's a corner to Crystal Palace Webb recovering very quickly there but that was a very intelligent throw by Hoy over his head which made him turn quickly Taylor to take the uh, corner for Crystal Palace Lai trying to go in Payne is there as well. This is coming through to Taylor to lift it back again. No, he's putting one in low and hard. Lachlan. And that's not going to go near enough even to cause uh, Benetti any concern whatsoever. John Lachlan. A really strong tackle there by Payne. Lachlan, Hine playing it off for Lachlan. And the ball falling nicely for Hine. And there's Hine! Oh, a great goal! Roger Hine! Oh, what a goal! Nothing he 
could have done about it, Bonetti. That really was the most powerful header. Roger Hoy, 1-1. Oh, will this give Palace even more heart? Osgood, Osgood again, and McCormick, Taylor, who's fought harder than anybody, he'll come through to Osgood. Well, the relief that, in, that must have come into that box was indescribable. Suddenly there's new hope for Crystal Palace. McCormick tackled very severely indeed from behind by Hutchinson. It looks as though he's having his name taken. Telling both Oscar and McCready, I'm not interested in you. And into the book goes the name of Ian Hutchinson. <laughs> Mr. Tinkler really had no hesitation whatsoever. <laughs> and it will be Skipper John Sewell to put more pressure on Chelsea. Closing in on Bonetti. And the referee telling those two Crystal players, Crystal Palace players, Queen and Hind, to watch the challenge. And certainly it's all to the credit of Bonetti, but he kept his eye on the ball and fisted it away. kick to Chelsea yeah, that'll be Johnny Hollins to take it yeah, Dempsey well up again complaining that Hoy isn't 10 yards away that signal was clear enough but get on with it says the referee so Hollins planting it high again Dempsey getting under it have been caught out by high balls coming into their area Osman. Osman in for 
is huge and Blythe covering it well. Shaw. And they throw to Chelsea. And now a corner to them. There's John Dempsey, number five, up in that penalty area again. Roger Hind has been pulled back to mark him. Barely in the corner quadrant, that uh, kick. Hudson. Another corner. to take it again Dempsey on the goal line and Hoy to get it away McCready to Hollins and now to Webb and Houseman goal of the season Peter Houseman but it's one that looks like making it pretty safe for Chelsea now Dempsey in fact is okay again and Hoy now for Crystal Palace Greedy it's straight to Lockwood little one two there with uh, Tony Taylor Lachlan and Hoadley a little slow off the mark and Houseman in first McCormick to Sewell looking for Queen but it's Houseman now it's Hutchinson Hudson and a corner to Chelsea. So Crystal Palace under a good deal of pressure now. They have been for long periods and now there's 3 1 down and not too much time left. Hoy. Good run by Hollins. And another corner. And it's Peter Hausman to take it. And it's there by Hutchinson.
So 4-1 to Chelsea, it finished a very good win for them, although afterwards the Crystal Palace manager, Bert Head, thought that there was a serious question mark against both the first and last Chelsea goals. He felt that a Palace player had been pushed at a critical moment in the penalty area. I don't think we should worry too much about the fourth goal. By then the game was, uh, was over. The first one, as Mr Head said, was uh, very important indeed. And the question is, was Mel Blythe pushed by Peter Osgood as they went for that ball in the penalty area? Jimmy Hill. Well, when a ma manager makes that kind of accusation, you can imagine we've looked at it pretty carefully. And what we did discover, and you'll see in a moment, is that Peter Osgood does jump with his hand in the air like that, as players often do. But what we have to decide is whether, in fact, he actually pushed. There you'll see him on the left of the post, number nine, going in there with Mel Blythe. Now you can see him ready to jump, and you can see his hand come up there. Now what you have to decide is whether in fact he does push Blythe as he heads the ball, or whether in fact that arm is just there for protection, and the ball is headed and goes slowly over Jackson's head into the net. Notice Tommy Baldwin in there, making it difficult for anybody to clear off the line. But the referee had to decide in a moment yesterday, um, we've had to decide uh, after a lot more thought uh, from then and I think the conclusion is that that was a fairer goal as you would see when people jump for a ball in the hurly-burly of a penalty area but uh, you know, the thoughts left in our minds would you like to be a referee or even more would you like to be a manager like Bert Head but Crystal Palace certainly didn't let them uh, let that reverse get them out of the game they came back very strongly they fought every man jack of them giving everything he had to the side and it was a fine goal from Roger Hoy which put them back in the game and it showed uh, the usefulness to them that Hine was up front he, for a big man he shows quite delicate skill here when eventually you get possession of the ball there's the kind of tackling that went on in yesterday's game Tommy Baldwin fighting like mad for it now what's that little flick of Hines there and then he makes a nice position down the left wing there's a miss hit cross or a rebound from a cross and there's Hine with a good left footed cross and you'll see Roger Hoy flying in the middle with one of the most powerful headers I've seen from a long while which leaves even Peter Bonetti with no chance at all. A really first class goal. Roger Hoy obviously very exalted there because Crystal Palace were back in the game. And in fact they showed plenty of spirit and I think at that moment and for the next ten minutes Chelsea looked as if they would like to take a count of at least nine or ten. They looked as if they might lose the match. But then I wonder whether Sir Ralph Ramsey who was watching the game had an effect on it because John Jackson, who's played brilliantly for them this year, has only had a, a couple of bad matches, and both of those were when Sir Alf was there. And I wonder, as Hollins takes this free kick, whether one might have expected him on normal form and no nerves to come out to where the ball drops. You'll see it's going on to the edge of the six-yard area. Should he have come with a fist and punched that ball away? It's too late for him to go now. He hasn't made up his mind to go there. And, of course, when the ball is headed well by Dempsey, who's got up very well, it just drops over his head into the back of the net. I reckon John Jackson, on his normal form, could well have saved that goal. So there it was, 2-1 to Chelsea, Crystal Palace still full of fight and fire. But Chelsea, with all their skill, all the strength that they have, how they can absorb pressure and then get back into the game, came back with a lot of fight and fire. Now it's interesting to note that all of Chelsea's goals in this game came from dead ball movements round the other goal where they were able to press up a number of players into the box. We've drawn attention to this before. They push up Dempsey, they push up Webb because they know that the ball is going to be in that area and if you put enough men there they can keep the ball in the area. This has come from a corner and it's rebounded out. Here it goes again, pumped back into the middle. You can see Dempsey number five there who jumps up absolutely brilliantly and gets the ball down to Hausman's run is in the centre of the picture just watch as he gets that ball, Hausman's running on, as good as a goal as you'll see for some time, there it is, beautiful running, anticipated the header off and whacked right into the corner of the net and once more Jackson is left straight. So there you can see the crowd, they must obviously be Chelsea fans with their hands high in the air, a very exciting moment, but it wasn't the end of Chelsea and they came back with one more goal just to rub it in. Palace fought uh, full marks to them, really, for keeping going in this game. They showed a lot of spirit, which is going to help them, I think, for the remainder of the season in their relegation fight. Every one of them keeps going all the while. But this last Chelsea movement, again from a corner, was too much for them. And there was a bit of argument about whether this was pushing and shoving or not, but you can see, again, the kind of thing that goes on in the penalty area, which a referee has to decide on. See, coming in from the right of your picture there, 
There's Ian Hutchinson going in. There's a bit of shoving between him and Roger Hine. I think it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. And then again, you notice how Tommy Baldwin, for the second time in the match, being near the goal line, stops the full back from kicking it off the line. So there was, the, although some people say Tommy Baldwin didn't have a very effective game, he does a lot of quiet things for Chelsea up front, which make it difficult for defenders. So what are the conclusions from that game? First of all, Crystal Palace are out. But on the other hand, if they can keep that spirit, on Wednesday night against Burnley and get two points, they may well forget they've ever lost the cup tie. Chelsea, of course, are through to the last eight. It's a happy story for them. But what did Sir Ralph go away thinking? I reckon he went away saying, I must include Osgood in my party. Hollins was a bit nervous at the start, but then came back. And more than that, I think that Alan Hudson, an 18-year-old, um, who perhaps has never been in the book before, might be penciled in uh, even more firmly than any of us care to imagine. One little point that I'd like to add to that, a number of Chelsea supporters got on to me yesterday and said, when are you going to get off Ian Hutchinson's back over these long throws that have been spotlighted on the big match? I just would add uh, that Ian must have taken, I suppose, eight or nine long throws yesterday. He was closely watched by the linesman and the referee, and all of them were fair throws. Our next action on the programme today, though, for that we go down to the West Country for Swindon, holders of the Football League Cup, of course, against 4th Division Scunthorpe. The pictures come from Harlech, Commentator Roger Malone and Swindon Howe, the team in the white shorts. Buxton with the throw for Scunthorpe. Keegan. This is Deere. Got Kerr outside, gives it in. Good pass. George, fine move this. Chance for Cassidy. Great chance. It's there. Cassidy has scored. Scunthorpe United have taken the lead. Heath taking the ball nicely away from trouble there. Back to Wellborn. Harland. Butler. Smart. Bypassing Butler to Thomas. Horsford looking for that one. Foxton. Smith. Rogers. Oh, well, how about that? A fine piece of play by Rogers. The goalkeeper positioned himself perfectly. And Don Rogers didn't quite hit it hard enough to beat Barnard. Good save by Barnard, because he positioned himself so well. Trollope, Donald Rogers. Horsfield. There's Trollope again on the overlap, and Keegan having to concede the corner kick. Very much a symptom of modern football there. You're attacking fullback, denied by your defending winger. Smith. Toller back to Rogers. Give it to the experts. The expert didn't do so well. Noble. It's there. A, mag a magnificent goal by Peter Noble. Peter Noble there. His 14th goal of the season and one that this Swindon crowd have never more needed. Now the second half. Gives it to Davidson. Smith intercepts and away goes Rogers. Away goes Rogers. He's got Horsfield inside him and Noble. There it is. It's there. It's there. Arthur Horsfield had scored for Swindon. And you can see the joy on his face. At last he scored. He's had four or five chances. And he had two chances at that one, and he took it very well indeed. Harland selling the dummy very well indeed. The Scunthorpe contingent in the crowd don't like it. Scum, uh, Harland knows that there's not too much time left, no risks to be taken. This is Deer. Young Deer there. He's faded out after a very good start. Trollope. Smith. Good ball through for Trollope or Horsfield. This is Trollope. John Trollope. He scored. John Trollope. A very good goal indeed by left back John Trollope. Well, that was a good win for Swindon. 3 1. As I say, holders of the Football League Cup, some real cup traditions there. They're not going to be easy meet for anyone in tomorrow's draw. Well, that, of course, wasn't the most glamorous of ties, but in that tie, we spotted what we felt was perhaps the most skillful goal of the day and also the most amusing goal of the day. Just see what you think as well. 
Well, the goal was scored by Noble, and Don Rogers played quite a part. He has the moustache, Rogers, taking the corner. Strangely enough, it's another goal coming from a corner kick. He makes one attempt to cross it there where he fails. It hits a player. Now, from this one, just watch Noble run in and guide that off the outside of his foot into the corner. Of the net. Really first-class skill. And here's Rogers making the next goal, which we thought was perhaps the funniest goal of the day, in slow motion this time. You can see, as it comes over, Horsfield goes in. There he is, number nine, running in there. And he gets it stuck underneath his feet. But he gets a second chance, everybody prays for. The ball's up in the air, he's missed the goal, but he gets the chance to throw himself off his feet, having kicked it and now headed into the back of the net. That was the goal that really put Swimming on the way, and what a strange goal it was. And next, of course, we turn to that game at Northampton, and this, of course, is going to please all our friends in Northern Ireland because it's the mighty George Best and Manchester United really rampant up there on the county ground. Northampton, then, against Manchester United. The pictures this time come from ATV. The commentator is Hugh Johns, and Manchester United are in the red, or if you haven't got colour, the darker shirt. Blackmore up strongly. Clark forward. Fair brother breaking. He's got Sadler there with him. Corner given. It looks like a goal kick to me. Certain indecision between linesman and referee. It certainly didn't look like a corner. Although Fair brother galloped after it, as though he was hoping it would be one. Charlton, a good touch forward for Kidd. But nobody on his right side to use. And had to slow it down for Kiernan to get the tackle in. McNeil, running himself into trouble. Dixie McNeil. Oh, yeah. Perrin forward for Kidd. In the middle is Morgan and Best. Book could lose it, it's Best! Georgie Best, well, what a comeback, what a way to come back into big-time football. Georgie Best, one nothing. Good bit of work by Ross, nice ball control. Fairfax four, as it turns out, Crevin. Elton waiting for Kiernan to come across to him. And he can hit Kiernan, Kiernan now. Best, well read by Rankmore. Good jump then by Dave Sadler. Ferran through for Best. Here he goes again. Georgie Best. What a beautiful bit of running by this man! This is Creran being chased by Kiernan. Waiting for Morgan to move. There's Willie Morgan. There's Kidd! A oh, great save by Book! A wonderful try by Kidd and a great save. As behind that goal mouth, the police are in there. Sorting out fights in the crowd. Cameraman down. As the police go into the crowd, dragging them out from behind that goal mouth. Dave Sadler, the short one for Crerant. Oh, what a beautiful ball. Sartori way in behind this defense. Now it's Kidd. Book getting just a touch, just enough. As the half-time whistle sounds. Uh, Northampton go in to get fresh fighting instructions from the manager, Dave Bowen. Manchester United quite happy with those two best goals. And there's the man that did it, Georgie Best. Two goals in the first half. Well, let's see what he can do in the second half. Georgie Best now tantalizing them again. Can he get in a shot? A chance here for Santoria as the book fell on that ball.
At the moment, this is certainly a game that is going to be remembered as, uh, well, almost a best birthday. Fair brother. Charlton feeding Kidd. Best free in the middle. Willie Morgan coming over to help Kidd now. And a chance for Best. Here's the hat trick. There it is eventually. Well, well, well. Georgie Best makes it a hat trick. But that third one is the easiest he'll ever score. This is Brooks. Large getting a touch. And Sadler whacking it away. Kid breaking out. Remember how he broke out like this against Manchester City. Best going through the middle. There's Best. It's fair, brother. Not a bad ball for Ross. Eric Ross, chap that started with Glen Torren in Ireland and then went to Newcastle. Rankmore. Did well to get the cross across. McNeil. Edwards hacks him down and the penalty spot has been pointed to, I think. Mr. Baldwin moving across very slowly. Penalty it is. Nevertheless, uh, a foul in the box. Must be a penalty. So the chance to drag the scoreline back to 3-1. Frank Rankmore. Already a couple of penalties. And he's missed it. It's McNeil and he's missed it too. Fairbrother was in with the second shot then. It just isn't Northampton's day. Brian Kidd brought down as Clark ran into him. And again, Kidd hurt in the back, an injury that he got in the first half of the game. Well, how about that then? Half an hour of the game left. Question now, I think, really, of how many... Manchester United are likely to score. Are they going to improve on the three goals that Best has given them? Fair brother to Rankmore. Fair brother again. Through ball for Large, just not on. Kid waiting for Sartori to come across. No, he cuts him out, he gives it to Charlton. Sadler. Now Sartori. Four men forward, Kidd on his left, Morgan in the middle with Best, and on the far side is Crerand. Brian Kidd. Saver then was Brooks. Kidd again. Here's Best. Number four. Georgie Best, just the tiniest touch. Willie Morgan under this. Brian Kidd. Sartori running beautifully. In the middle, Charlton. Book got a touch to that. It's a corner. What a beautiful ball from number eight there, Carlo Sartori. Rolling it right in the path of his skipper, Bobby Charlton. And the old left foot whacking it goalwards. Bobby Charlton, who hasn't had a great deal of luck in the goal scoring stakes this season, only eight goals in all. There he is. Touch for Kidd. Brian Kidd. And that's the way goal scoring is made to look easy. Willie Morgan. Running a yard too far. Fairfax takes him out. That's a good ball for Felton. Now the cross into the goal mouth should find Large and... Well, 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 Large and Fairbrother were in the goal mouth, but they weren't sitting in the crowd, which is where that ball went. And we've got a substitution. Bobby Charlton has come off the field. And on is Francis Burns. Here he is, number 12. Francis Burns, who was replaced in the side today by Tony Dunn. He's been playing left back for the side.
in and forward for Dixie McNeil. Dave Sadler sure as a rock. There's the substitute, Burns. Right in action right away. Best going through the middle. He's on for five. There it is. Oh, Georgie Best. Paddy Crowder with his throw in then. Kid. And Fairfax coming out for Northampton. Felton running right side. Fairfax going forward for return pass, but Felton getting into some difficulty. It's Ross now. And Ian Ewer, solid as a rock. What a difference this man has made to the Manchester United back line since they bought him from Arsenal. And what a difference this man makes to any front line. There's George Best. Two burns. Has Kidd forward on the far side of two unmarked men. One of them is Willie Morgan, who should get another goal here. No, Kidd does. Well, you've got to feel sorry for Brooklyn. He made the first save, dropped the ball, and Kidd whacks it in. That's number seven. Joe Kiernan for Brooks. And a tackle, a sliding tackle then by Edwards on Brooks. The free kick to Northampton. Edwards getting away to Morgan. Brooks in strongly. Now Ross. Ross a chance. He's trying to feed his forwards instead of shooting. Number four running is Clark. That's a good ball. There's Large. And now Dixie McNeil. It's there. Dixie McNeil gets one back. Well, there he is, the hero of Northampton, who makes it 7-1 now. Fairfax in trouble with that pass. Willie Morgan, kid on his left. Burns coming through forward of him, and Best out on the right. Here's Best. Oh, what a great save. Tremendous shot and a great save from Brook. Very nearly the record that time. Here's McNeil. Large is onside. Being chased by Sadler. Could be in for one here. Right across the goal bar. Well, when nothing goes right for you, absolutely nothing goes right for you. Kid. Kid. Winning this ball. Faced by Rankmore, who has a chance to intercept. Kid not able to move as fast as he was earlier. Kid who's twice been down with an injury. Here's Crerand. Best. Here's the record. There it is. George Evers sets a new scoring record for Manchester United. Six goals in a game. Frank Moore getting it forward as Kiernan moves in on four, five defenders, United defenders. Fairbrother, cross ball, Large going in, and he's got it. Frank Large. Ross to feed Felton, I would suspect. No, a cheeky one down the line for Fairbrother. And another corner, no. Foul against Fairbrother for holding back Sadler. And George Best has already taken up his position on the very far side of the field there, and he's first away down the tunnel, too. He wasn't going to wait. Already down there behind those policemen, George Best, the hero of this game, has gone. George Best, six goals. Brian Kidd, two. Large and McNeil getting the two goals for Northampton as the crowd piles onto the pitch. What an extraordinary game, that one, Jimmy. Um, 
I've seen most of it this morning, and I must say I got the impression, although George Best got six goals, that it looked very much as though he had been out of the game for about four weeks. He did look. Yeah, well, at times rusty. he looked a player, you know, who really uh, had had a four-week rest and needed the training. But uh, I think Northampton contributed as much as anything else to Manchester United's eight goals, and I'm sure they'd be a bit disappointed with that performance. I think they could have done that much better. In fact, it, Paddy Cleary seemed to have a great game in the middle of the field, and here's Brian Kidd making the first of Best goals. Uh, Fair old cross that, and there's Best. He does jump well for this one, although the goalkeeper helps him by missing it, like an eel going up there, wriggling and heading the ball into the back. So that was his first, and there's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, it, the game was presented to Manchester United pretty well from that moment on. There's George laughing his head off. He must be a very happy man. Uh, there are not many players in football, of course, who've scored six goals away, whether they play well or badly in the course of it, but George did. His last goal, I think, does give us a chance to show the real genius of Best, whether he's half fit, fully fit, or whatever he is. And it's a lesson also to players, when they're right the way through, how to commit a goalkeeper, throw him into the wrong corner, and then slot the ball home with nobody there. Paddy Creer makes a marvellous tackle uh, to get possession and slides a most delicate ball through there to Best, which puts him through the whole of the defence. That's the way a first division side cuts through when it's really going. There he goes from now on striding through, great acceleration. Now you see the goalkeeper come out and watch as Best pretends to shoot there. See that dummy? Goalkeeper's gone, he's committed him, and it's a very easy job. Even I fancy putting that one in the back of the net, providing I could have got there as best as in the first place. But how much better, one final point, uh, Manchester United seem to be now with Pat Creran back in their side. Well, six goals from George Best, who can ask for more? Nineteen in all. Uh, I must say it's been a, a tremendously exciting programme to work on. I hope it's been as enjoyable for you at home watching it. Uh, we're pretty bucked in London. Well done, Queen's Park Rangers. Well done, Watford. But I suppose most Londoners still regard Chelsea as their finest bet for a Wembley side. And I suppose that will remain so all the time they can go on scoring goals like the one you're going to see now that will finish up our programme, the goal by Peter Hausman at Selhurst Park yesterday. McCready to Hollins. And now to Webb. And Hausmann 